Amen. Well, everybody have a good day. Amen. You know, every, every day is a good day. Whether you have a, a habit or not, every single day is a good day. You know why God made it? Jesus actually made it for you. And he filled it with blessings. So now it's up to you and me to partake of those blessings. Amen. You ought to start like I do every single morning. A lot of times before I get out of bed or the first thing when I get out of bed, I say, Jesus, you made this day. It's a day you made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Right? That's how we should start every single day. I've been doing that for years and it works. <laughs> amazing, amazing how smart God is. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Well, let's go back to John chapter 14, verse 27, where we left off last night. It is 7 o'clock. Pastor told me not to go past 10. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Hallelujah. John 14, 27, where we left off last night, where Jesus said he gave us his peace. I love this verse. Jesus said he gave us his peace. That means we have it. You know, whether you feel it or not, you have it, but you have to use it by faith. Amen. You have to use your faith and speak peace to every storm. Amen. Jesus gave, you know, you know, when the disciples didn't do anything right and they went and got Jesus, Jesus got up and showed them what they should have done. Amen. So they should have spoken peace to that storm, but they didn't. But you and I can speak peace to every storm because Jesus gave us his peace. That's good news, isn't it? He said, I give you my peace, not the way the world gives. And then he said this, because he gave you his peace, he said, now you get to make a choice. That's what he said. He said, let not. Doesn't let not mean that you have a choice whether you let or don't let? Yes. Right? So it's a choice. Choice is powerful. Yes. You get to make the choice. You know what the Lord told me? The Lord told me about that. He said, everyone makes a choice either on purpose or by default. Yeah, that's right. Come on. That's true. Yeah, come on. Think about that. Yeah. Choose life or choose death. Choose blessing or choose cursing. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Right here, let not. So if all of a sudden you're starting to feel depressed and you don't do anything about it, you just go ahead and get depressed, then you made a choice by default. Well, I'm just so used to feeling that way, so I just guess it's, I accept, yeah, well, you chose, you chose death over life. Yeah. Getting stressed, worried, uptight about something, anxious, yeah. panic attacks, you're making a choice yeah. to let that feeling stay. You're making a choice. Now, sometimes it's just because you are lacking the knowledge from the Word of God, which is why we're teaching it. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5 verse 13 says, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Yes. So if we don't know Jesus gave us his peace, we don't know that he redeemed us on the cross from every negative emotion, then maybe by default we just automatically allow depression to stay or stress or panic attacks to stay. But it's still, you're making a choice by default. You're just doing it because that's just for you, it's normal. But it's not normal for the kingdom of God. And you're part of the kingdom of God, right? So it's not normal. You're not, you're, not, you're not a normal being. You're a super normal, <laughs> supernatural, amen? You have been translated out of darkness into light. The greater one dwells on the inside of you. Wow. So he says, let not. That means you get to make a choice. Don't let depression stay. Don't let discouragement stay. Don't let... Stra it's going to come. But don't let it stay. In fact, let's jump over to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, where it shows us, you know, that we're going to have moments where stress comes, moments where depression comes, moment discouragement, moments guilt, moments shame. We're going to have those moments of panic. We're going to have those moments of hurt feelings. We're going to have all those moments. But you're supposed to, what the Lord told me, he said, when, you, when the moment comes, keep it as a moment. Don't build a monument. So in other words, don't make a big deal out of it. Make a little small anthill out of it. Right? Kick it over. So John 16, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me 
you may have peace. King James says you might have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So we're, we're going to see right here in this verse that you're going to have the moment. All of the stress, depression, worry, fears, and all those things, you're going to have moments of all those things, but you get to make a choice. One, one, uh, one man walked up went to the late Kenneth E. Hagin before he went to heaven. A man walked up to him and said, uh, Brother Hagin, pray for me that I don't have any more t- tests and trials. <laughs> Brother Hagin said, you want me to pray that you die? Because <laughs> the only way you're not going to have tests and trials is if you're not here. <laughs> Go on to heaven. <laughs> Because you're not going to have any tests and trials up there, but you will as long as you're here. So Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. Now, that's really a little blind. Whether it's the King James where it says you might have or the New King James you may have, both of those are really an error to the original Greek. Uh, because when, like in our language, when you say you might have something, that means you might or you might not is the way we use the might. Or you may or you may not. Well, that's not what it says in the original Greek at all. In fact, if you look up this in the Greek and look at the Greek context, you may have or you might have is just one word. It's not three, three different words. It's one word. It's the Greek word echo. Echo means to hold, to possess. Uh, it means ability. It means relation. And it means condition. It's actually a verb, so that means there's action, action involved here. It's a primary verb. To hold, to possess, it means ability, relation, and condition. So literally what he's saying here, I've spoken these things to you so that you would know in me you hold peace, you possess peace peace, you have an ability of peace, you have a relationship with peace, and you are conditioned to live in peace. And that sounds a whole lot better than, well, you just might have it, (laughs) or you might not. (laughs) No, he says, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you know you're holding peace, you possess peace, your ability is peace, You you have a relation with peace, and you're conditioned with peace. That's a lot stronger, isn't it? So that's the, and he started it out, these things I've spoken to you. So that would include, since we know the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse, then less than one and a half chapters before this, we just read, Jesus said, I give you my peace. And then he says, these things I've spoken to you. So that's one of the things he spoke to us then, right? He said, these things I've spoken to you that in me, you hold peace, possess peace, your relationship is with peace, you're conditioned for peace. Uh, you have it, so hold on to it. He said, but listen, in the world, now you're in the world, but you're not of the world, but you're still in the world, and right now he's going to tell you what's going to happen while you're in it. In the world, you shall have tribulation. So that means we're going to have those moments, doesn't it? Now, obviously, it's supposed to be a moment because of what he goes on to say. You don't want to just take that statement out of its context. You'll get con. You want to make sure you read the context. He says, in the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Literally, the Greek says, be bold and courageous. You're going to have tribulation, but be bold and courageous because. So, So when you have the moment, you don't let it stay. That moment of stress. In fact, if you look up this word, Uh, tribulation, it means pressure, anguish, burdens, persecutions, trials. So it's, it includes every negative emotion. When you see the, the definitions of, uh, pressure, pressure, that includes stress, anger, frustration, that would be pressure. And then the definition anguish, anguish would include depression, discouragement, hurt feelings. And then the, uh, The definition burdens, that would mean cares and worries and panic attacks and guilt and shame and all that stuff. So he says, in the world, you're going to have all these things come against you, all these negative emotions, but be bold and courageous. Now, how can we be bold and courageous when all hell's breaking loose against our feelings? He said, because I've overcome the world. 
When the Lord brought me to this and actually taught this to me, he said, did you notice the last two words of this verse? I was looking at the King James, and I said, yeah, the world, the world, the last two words. In the world, you'll have tribulation, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, the world. He said, now look that up in the Greek, and I did. He said, now go back up in the verse and find those same two Greek words. I went back up, and I said, oh, yeah, there they are again. In the world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Now get a hold of this. This is what the Lord taught me. He said, so, so break this down. I'm, I'm going to just maybe do it limitedly. He, he went into a lot more detail with me so I'd understand, but I'm going to just use a couple of illustrations that he used on me. He said, okay, so what does it mean, the world? Well, he's talking about the tribulation that the world brings you, right? So even break that down. What do you mean the tribulation? Okay, the stress, the depression, the worry, the panic attacks. All right, so in the world, in the world, the world is going to throw stress at you, pressure, depression, discouragement at you. But be bold and courageous. I've overcome the stress that the world's going to throw at you. I've overcome the depression. I've already defeated it. Well, that's what we saw. That's why we, before we ever came to this verse, that's what we saw over in the great redemptive chapter of Isaiah 53, right? That Jesus bore for us in our place, our stress, our depression, our discouragement. He bore it for us. And then he faced every reason or cause for us to feel that way and defeated those reasons and causes, right? Amen. And so now we're seeing the same thing here. He said, listen, in the world, they're going to come against you, but be bold and courageous. I've already overcome it for you. I've already defeated it for you, and I've already defeated whatever the reason or cause is. Yeah. Amen. That, that gives you boldness yeah. and courage. Yeah. Be bold and courageous. I've overcome the world. Yeah. I love the Amplified. My wife always carries her 100-pound Bible with her, <laughs> and I have to carry it. <laughs> and it's an Amplified. The Amplified says, I've deprived it, talking about the world. Yeah. I've overcome the world. The Amplified says, I've deprived it of power to harm you. Well, I mean, even without the Amplified, you would know that if you've read the great redemptive chapter. Because if Jesus defeated it and it's defeated, then it has no power. Right? Right? But I like the Amplified because then it's just adding to and showing us again and again and again the same thing. He's the devil and the depression. We know that Satan's the one behind the fear and the panic attacks and the depression, the discouragement and the hurt feelings and the bad temper and anger and all that. He's behind all of that. And so he's defeated. That means he's powerless. Here's what the Lord showed me. Everybody look up here at me real quick. So when the Lord was teaching me this, he said, Larry, he said, when depression, he used all the different ones. I'm just going to use a couple, but he said, when depression comes against you, it comes as a thought. It has no power over you because I, Jesus said, have already defeated it. I've deprived, amplified, I've deprived it of power to harm you and conquered it for you. So in other words, it does that depression cannot make you depressed. So when the feeling comes, it's powerless to make you feel that way. You have to choose by choice or by default, right? So you're making a choice either way. So when you feel depressed, that depression comes and that moment comes, just remember what Jesus taught me. He said, Larry, it, it's powerless. It's a facade, it's a big bag of hot air is what the Lord told me. <laughs> big bag of hot air. It has no power to make me depressed. Here's what the Lord showed me. Because it has no power to make you depressed, it, watch this, it has to try and get you to believe in it. And when you believe in it, you empower it to overwhelm you. It's usurped your authority and your power. And then all of a sudden, now you're down in the dumps. Why'd God let this happen to me? He didn't. He gave you his peace that's more powerful than everything that's happening to you. You already defeat what's happening to you. He already defeated it for you. You just got to have simple childlike faith. Amen. 
And so then he used another one. That was depression. What about stress? Stress is huge today. When stress comes against people and you're in a stressful situation and you feel stress, it has no power to make you stressed. It has to try and get you to believe that you're stressed. And then you empower it to make you feel that way. And then you, you're stressed all day. God never created you or your body to be stressed or to be depressed or to be mad. You, you're not, you can't handle it physically. I've had doctors tell me when people come into the office and tell them all their symptoms, which are real. I mean, stress is real. Depression is real. All those things are real. We're not denying they're not real. They're real, but they're real defeated. They're real powerless unless I empower them. That's right. Come on. But the doc- I've heard several doctors talk about it, say they come in, they tell us their problems and their real symptoms, their real situations, but we can't diagnose it because in medical school, you know, one doctor was telling me in medical school, for example, he said, somebody says, these are my symptoms, my pains in the, which part of the body. And they said in medical school, we were taught, oh, well, that was, that's going to fall in one of four categories. Or it could be one of six categories. Let's just use four for now for this example. He said, one of four categories. He said, so then I have to try and figure out which category that your problem is in. And I'm guessing. And some spirit-filled doctors are praying in tongues, hoping (laughs) that they'll guess right, (laughs) you know. And, um, And so they... They, they say, okay, so this is probably what's wrong with you. And then they prescribe medicine. This is how they were taught in school. They prescribe the medicines that they were told that would go with that. And so they give you those medications, and lo and behold, you get worse. And then you go back to the doctor, and they say, well, let's try curtain number two. <laughs> Some of you all are too old for that. Game show, huh? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> let's try box number two. No, no. Um, so, well, let, let's try this, you know. It, it, since it wasn't that, it's got to be this. And, and by the time they go through all four things, they've diagnosed four different things that because of the pains you told them and the first one didn't work, second one, third one, fourth one. By the time the fourth one didn't work, you've had a lot of different medications put in your body that made you worse. Kind of sounds like a biblical story we're all familiar with. A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and suffered many things of many physicians. We're not knocking physicians. We're just pointing out what the Bible says. They're trying to help, but they're not perfect. There's only been one physician that ever lives that never practiced medicine. All the the rest practice. (laughs) I don't want them practicing on me. (laughs) Hallelujah. So here's the point. Though all of those feelings, the depression, it's real, but it's powerless. So it has to usurp your authority, get you to believe in it, usually because of lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, or Isaiah 5, 13, like I mentioned, no knowledge. So if we don't know that, then by default we'll just fall into it, thinking that, well, it's normal. I've had this all my life, so I've just got to put up with it. But no, you don't. You have authority. You have dominion over it. So God, that's why Jesus said, these things that I've spoken to you, that in me you realize you're holding on to peace. You have it. You possess it. It's your ability, your condition for it. So now, when these things in the world come against you, understand you be bold and courageous because I've already conquered those things for you, deprived it of the power. I've used this example many times. Some of you probably have heard this example. Like if I came up to you and handed you this beautiful package and you took it from me and you looked at it and you thought to yourself, man, I, I don't think I've ever seen a package this beautiful. Man, you, Brother Larry, you really, you must have got Liz to help you wrap this one. It's so pretty. And so you're looking at it and just oohing and on over the gorgeous package. And, 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 and of course, your attention's not on me. Your attention's on the package. And so finally, when you look up from the package to look at me, you see me running off way down, <laughs> down the distance. Uh-oh. Brother Larry, where are you going? And you hear me say, it's a bomb. <laughs> 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 
And then all of a sudden, when you hear me say it's a bomb, you look down and all of a sudden you see this little timer. And it's counting 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. It's gotten down to five seconds when you finally see it. Let me ask you a question before we go any further with the illustration. Would you have an opportunity to be stressed? I'm talking naturally now. Would you have a... I mean, you know, a bomb, you're holding a bomb and, and it's got five seconds till it explodes. Would you have an opportunity to get in fear, a panic attack, probably mad at me and ready to kill me if you ever got a chance? And, I mean, you probably have every negative emotion coming against you, right? Yeah. But let's say that right behind you is Pastor Mark. And he all of a sudden leans up to you when there's only five seconds and you're looking at the five seconds not knowing what to do. And Pastor Mark says, don't worry, I took the explosives out. You know what you would do? You wouldn't stress. Yeah, you'd hug him, right? (laughs) You wouldn't be depressed. You wouldn't get in fear. You know what you'd probably do? You'd probably do this. Four, three, two, one, click. You'd be smiling. Bye, Brother Larry. Now, why didn't you get stressed? Because the bomb had no power. Why didn't you get a panic attack? The bomb had no power. Are you listening? That's what Jesus did with your stress. He took all the explosives out. He took all the power out. There is no power to make you ever depressed again, discouraged again, fearful again, panicking again frustrated, guilt-ridden, shame-filled. No, there's no power in any of those emotions to make you feel that way. Boy, that's good news. Isn't that awesome? And so that's why we're said, okay, don't, don't let it then. You don't have to let it because it's powerless. Jesus already defeated it. That's why, I'm going to go to a verse that every one of you know, uh, that's why God says, cast it. Where's that verse? Remember 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7? Let's go over there. We need to look at that one. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, because this is one the Lord brought me to when he was teaching me all this years ago about how to never have another down day the rest of my life, and I have not had one since he taught me this. I've had plenty of opportunity. <laughs> People hear me say, you know, it's been decades since I've had a depressed day or stress-filled day or discouraged day or strife-filled day or whatever. Uh, I say, don't get me wrong. I passed up a lot of marvelous opportunities. <laughs> but that's the thing. You and I can pass them up. Why? Because Not because we're somebody special, but because he did it all. Jesus did it all for us. It's all about Jesus. When you get your eyes off of him and self, that's when you get stressed. That's when you get depressed. That's when you get in fear. That's when, oh, my God, what's going to happen because the the war and, and the government and politics. And, and you just get all messed up in your head because you're all concerned about what you're going to do instead of what Jesus already did. Amen. I'm not saying we don't pray and use our authority. We do that. I'm not saying we don't vote. We do vote, and we vote Bible. We don't vote platform. You know what I mean by that? Republican, Democrat, whatever. You don't vote that. You vote what the Bible says. Amen. So Jesus brought me to this verse 7, and he told me to read it. So I read casting. I had the King James. Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. And the Lord asked me, he said, what's the first, first word of this verse? And I said, casting. And he said, would you ever start a thought or a sentence with the word casting? I said, no, sir, I would not. He said, neither would I. <laughs> he said, why don't you back up and see what I'm actually saying? And of course, again, we know the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse. The verses and chapters were added later to help us find stuff. But uh, so you back up, and of course I backed up and read the whole chapter to get to the word casting. But then when I got to the middle of that fifth verse where it says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you, casting all your care on him for he cares for you. And then I saw it. I saw what the Lord was wanting me to say. Wait a minute. He said, God resists the proud, but gives what to the humble? Grace. Grace is how you got saved. Grace is how you get healed. Grace is how you live in peace. Grace is how you live in joy. It's by grace that you're saved from 
sin, saved from worry, saved from panic attacks, saved from sickness, you name it. It's by grace you're saved through faith. And so right here he said God gives grace to the humble. So then he does not say, so just let me humble you. Uh Uh-uh. God doesn't humble you. You humble yourself. It's choice. You're not a puppet. God doesn't make anyone accept Jesus and go to heaven. Don't you wish he would? Because, you know, we don't want anybody dying and going to hell. But yet God never made anyone a puppet. He gave every human being a choice. You can choose life or choose death. So he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, which means resisting the proud just simply means that God's grace is withheld. It's not allowed to flow into somebody's life that is not believing not believing in Jesus, not believing in what he's done. So God resists that kind of person, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, who's the humble? Well, the one that humbles yourselves under the mighty hand of God by casting your care. Did you see that? Humble yourself by casting all your care. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care. So the word casting is just right along with the previous verse, of humility, casting your care, or making a decision, I refuse to be depressed. That's humility. That's what he's saying here. If you want to humble yourself, then you're going to have to say, you're too big to worry. You're too big to get your feelings hurt and get all uptight and mad. No, I'm not going to do that. Jesus, you did that for me. You already deprived that feeling of, dep- of depression, of power to harm me. You've already deprived that stress. You've already deprived that hurt feeling. You've already deprived that bad temper. And anger. You've deprived it of power. I don't have to yield to it, and I refuse to. By doing that, you're humbling yourself, believing what the Word says, and then grace is released. God gives grace to the humble. That's, that's how you come boldly to the throne of grace is by being a doer of the word. Amen, yeah. You come boldly to the throne of grace. What's boldly? Confidence and assurance that what Jesus did was enough. Amen. So I just humble myself and say, uh-uh, I'm not worried about that. I'm not stressed. I'm not going to be depressed about that. I'm not going to be uptight about that. I refuse because Jesus already took care of it for me. Wow. Wow. So he says, humble yourself by casting all your care. And then when, when I saw that, I thought, oh, so, so if I don't cast it, then I'm not humbling myself. And the Lord said, exactly. He said, when you worry about something, you're entering into pride. When you allow depression to come in, you're entering into pride. When you allow discouragement guilt, shame, all those negative emotions, when you allow them to come in, what you're doing is you're entering into pride. Um, I think, I think we're told that before we even get to verse six, God resists the, so in context then, not humbling yourself would be the context of the proud. And what the Lord showed me is he said, when you allow stress, depression, discouragement, all those things, you're just self-centered. You're not Jesus-centered. You're self. It's all about self. What they did to me and how you hurt me and how she and then he and this and that and the other. And it's all about me. When you're not dead, he's not done. (laughs) Humble yourself. Humble. You have to do it. You have to humble yourself. And when you actually recognize that, wow, so you're saying when I get discouraged and allow discouragement to stay, I'm entering into pride? Well, I'm not saying it. God is. I'm just showing you what he said. <laughs> I'm just repeating him. But yeah, that's, that's what you're doing when you... And, and the Lord told me this. He said, he said, worry, and then he used all the other words for you know depression, discouragement, hurt feeling, all those things. But let's just take one. He said, worry is one of the most dangerous and deceptive forms of pride. 
I'm going to show you why in just a second. He said, he said, worry, and you can put stress, depression, all those things in that same word there. It's one of the most dangerous forms of pride, yeah. and it's one of the most deceptive. And you'll see why here in a minute is because people don't, people that are operating in depression and need to go take their depression medication, they don't even realize they're operating in pride. So it's very deceptive. See, we think pride is just somebody that thinks they're all that. That is a form of pride if you think you're all that, because you're none of that. <laughs> I'm none of that. <laughs> we're, we're all a big, a, big, a big zero with the rims knocked out. <laughs> yeah. So God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves by casting your care. When you don't do that, then you're allowing that care to stay. You've entered into pride, and pride comes before a what? So get ready. Here you go. And then so many Christians that don't know that, they blame God. That God, why did you let this happen to me? This is a terrible thing that's happening in my life. And they don't even realize it wasn't God. In fact, God's been trying to speak to you the whole time. But you were down in what we call the dumps. You were down in the rut, so to speak. In fact, let me show you what the Lord showed me. Hold your place in 1 Peter and go over to Luke chapter 21. Hold your place in Peter. Go to Luke chapter 21, and we'll go to verse 34. Let me show you what happens. Remember I just told you that the two things that Jesus told me about stress, worry, depression, all those things, he said they're one of the most dangerous forms of pride. We're going to see why it's so dangerous in just a second. And then why are they so deceptive? Finding out that people don't even realize it, that they're in pride. That's, very, that's deception. So let's look at here at Luke chapter 21, verse 34, where it says, Take ye, I'm going to read from the King James, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come on you unaware. The new King James says, Carousing drunkenness and cares of this life. But the King James says, uh, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged. This word hearts is the same one in John 1427, where we found out it was talking about your emotions, your feelings. So don't let your emotions and feelings be troubled. Don't let them be afraid, right? This same word here, so he's talking about your emotions. Don't allow your emotions, your feelings to be overcharged. That word overcharged, you may see in a couple of other translations like the Amplified. Uh, the Greek means weighed down, overburdened, all right? So don't, don't let yourself... Uh, your emotions be weighed down and overburdened with. And then it gives three things. It says with surfeiting, if you look up the word surfeiting, vines, vines expository dictionary of New Testament words, he actually said this means the giddiness and the headache caused from alcohol. Giddiness. And so if you've ever seen somebody with that they're not really drunk, but they've had enough alcohol where they're a little tipsy, you know what I mean? And they, they kind of think everything's funny. Somebody walks up and says, your grandma just got in an accident. They start laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, seriously, your grandma just got in an accident. You don't, no, you don't know that you're, you're, you're out of your mind. You're not thinking clearly. That's what alcohol would do. And that's what he's talking about surfeiting here. He says your, your emotions are uh, overcharged with alcohol, surfeiting. And then the next word is drunkenness, also alcohol related. But this Greek word alcohol is talking about somebody that's drank so much. They haven't passed out, but they're almost to that point. In other words, they're just like what we call what stone drunk. I've never been that because so, I was never real a big alcohol drink. I, I tried tequila sunrise a couple times. <laughs> For those of you that know that, that's not a strong drink. But anyway, um, and I never, for some reason, I never liked beer. I hated the taste of it, so I never drank it. But, but stone drunk, in other words, just means, well, you, you guys probably know better than I do. But anyway, <laughs> or, or, or the saying, <laughs> Brother Brian, now come on now. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> the, remember, the old, remember the old man? He has to remind you sometime. Remember the, you know, <laughs> I love my brother Brian there. He's a good boy, a good man. <laughs> uh, I'd never want to meet brother Brian in a dark alley, though. I'll tell you that much right now. It's me, Brian. Hold it. It's me. <laughs> Flashlight, please. 
<laughs> so overcharged with surfeiting, that's alcohol related, and that's just a little bit of alcohol, enough to where your brain cells are not working correctly, and you're not thinking right, and you're not really uh, very useful. But then drunkenness is somebody that's just almost to the point of passing out. Um, so both of those conditions, alcohol related, let me just give you this example, because we're talking about conditions that are deceptive and dangerous, uh, with, along with the, you know, the cares that we're supposed to be casting all your care. Um, so if you were, let's say you were having marriage problems and you need some marriage counseling, you wouldn't go find someone that was giddy with alcohol or somebody that was drunk as a skunk and say, please give us counsel. <laughs> Why? Why would you not do that? Because they're not in their right mind, right? Well, he goes on and he says, um, don't be overcharged, overburdened with alcohol, with alcohol. And then he says, with alcohol. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He said, with the cares of this life. Exactly. Depression alcohol. Discouragement alcohol. Anger alcohol. I've never said this before. This is coming hot off the press. So just, just, just hang in there. Keep pulling because we're having a good time already. <laughs> you're, having, you're having drinks of, of hurt feelings and you're having drinks of, of guilt and you're having drinks of shame rather than resisting them and humbling yourself and saying, no, I'm not doing that. I want grace to flow. Grace. I want grace to flow. I don't want to be getting into pride where grace doesn't flow. So I resist this alcohol. I'm not going to drink it. And the Lord, actually, the Lord didn't teach me that. That just came as revelation to me right now as I'm teaching to you. But what the Lord taught me, he, he, when he brought me here, he said, when you allow stress to stay when it comes, when you allow depression to stay when it comes, hurt feelings, all those things, when, they, when you allow them to stay when they come and you enter into that pride with maybe not even realizing you're in under pride, he said, you're no better off than a drunk. And we'd be easy. I mean, you know, we see some drunk in the gutter. Oh, my God, look at that guy. And you're all stressed out about something. And he comes out of his stupor and he says, oh, my good goodness, look at him. I'm not stressed about anything. <laughs> I tell you, we are having a time here tonight. Woo! So this is what the Lord showed me. He said, so this is the, the deceitfulness of it is you don't even realize when you're worried and stressed about something, you're no better off than the drunk in the gutter. You're, the, you're in the same position. You're down, and even though God's talking, you're not hearing. You're not where you're supposed to be, where the wavelengths are, are flowing. The Holy Ghost is talking. He's still talking. A lot of Christians say, I don't understand why God's not talking to me. I've been crying out. I've been praying. You know, I hear Pastor Mark say God said, and I hear Pastor Pam say God said, and, and Miss Liz, and I hear this person and that person in the church, God said, and God said, and I've been crying out, and I haven't heard anything God said. And what you don't realize, he's been saying it to you just as much as anybody else, but you've been down in your, in your alcohol. And you've been stressed, and you've been depressed, and you've been discouraged, and you're letting that alcohol keep you from hearing the voice of God. That is dangerous. Remember, we saw it was deceptive, but now we're going to talk about dangerous, because notice what it goes on to say. So that day come on you unawares, talking about the return of Jesus. So he said, you're actually, when you're when you're drunk on worry and drunk on panic and drunk on these different emotion, negative emotions, he said, you're so out of it that you're not even aware of what the Spirit of God is saying. So you're not even aware that Jesus is going to be coming back soon. You're not aware that God just told you to do this and do that to stay out of trouble. That's dangerous. And, and here's the deal. It does, when you allow things to stay, they don't get better. I didn't tell you, but when God said in, um, 
In 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care, that word care is the Greek word marimna, M-E-R-I-M-N-A, marimna. And here's the deal, when you allow it to stay and you enter into pride, then all of a sudden there's no grace, and marimna is not a root word. The care, the worry, the stress that you're supposed to be getting, that, that marimna is not a root word. It comes from a root word in the Greek, marizo. It's actually the same exact word used, marizo, and you'll be familiar with when I tell you, is when Jesus said, a kingdom that is divided itself against itself cannot stand. That word divided is the word marizo. Marizzo is what marimna, cares, come from. Worry, stress, depression, all that stuff. So what happens when you allow the cares, it causes you to be divided, marizzo. Or if you look it up, that word marizzo, yes, it means divided. It also means cut, uh, to come apart or to cut into pieces. Have you ever heard somebody say, I just feel like my life is falling apart. I just feel like I'm falling into pieces. Well, that's you've let marimna stay until you entered into marizzo, and that's dangerous because that's right where the devil wants you. But the good news is we don't have to allow him because he's already been defeated. Whipped, stripped, and defeated. Powerless. Can't make us feel that way. But we have to know that because it's very deceptive, and if we're not aware of it, then it's going to be very dangerous. Because even though God's still talking to you the whole time, you're not listening. Pastor Mark or Pastor Pam, they tell you something by the Spirit of God, and you just go on and you walk out and you say, yeah, they just didn't understand what I'm going through. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't mentally, but when they spoke the answer to you out of the Bible, then they were being led by the Holy Ghost. Wow. Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves lest at any time. Now get a hold of that. Here's some really good news in this verse right here. Take heed to yourselves lest at any time your emotions get overcharged. Doesn't any time mean all the time? Any time. Doesn't matter what time it is, that time of day, that time of month, that time of election, that time of year, that time, that time, or that time. He said, at any time, you don't have to allow your emotions to be overcharged. Why? Because God's peace, God's redemption is greater than time. Whatever time it is you're in right now, whatever natural thing you and I are in right now, God's way is higher. Man, thank you, Lord. Uh, you're still holding Peter. Go over to Mark chapter 4 with me. Is anybody getting anything? This is showing you how to do this. It's not hard if we just do it God's way. I mean, really, it just comes out to simple childlike faith. Simple childlike faith. Wow, God said. Okay, God said, then I can. God said, then I am. (laughs) Right? I remember when I was three... Four, almost four years old, and I was standing up on the dock. I hadn't learned to swim yet. My daddy was down in the, in the lake, and he was six feet tall, and he was in about five feet of water, and I think I'm, I may have been three and a half feet or four foot tall by then, so it was over my head. And daddy said, Larry, jump, and I'll catch you. I didn't stand up there and try and figure out whether he would catch me or not. I didn't stand up there as a three to four year old and say, what if my daddy's lying? <laughs> I I didn't stand up there and say, you know, Daddy could be trying to trick me. You're just a fooling, aren't you? You want me to jump, and then you're going to go, ha, 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 just kidding. No, I I had none of those thoughts. Why? Because Daddy said. I had full confidence in my Daddy's word. If Daddy said, come, jump, and I'll catch you, guess what Larry did? Without thinking. That's where we get into problem, yeah. is thinking. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we let our emotions, and we let, okay, yeah, but, but she said this, and, you know, they did this, and this happened, and we get thinking. And we let, the, we let our brains and our minds become the devil's playground. Right. 
All right, did I tell you to turn to Mark chapter 4? Mark chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. This is the parable of the four soils where you got the wayside ground, the stone, or the the stony ground, and then the thorny ground. And this is the thorny ground here in Mark chapter 4, verse 18. It said, these are the ones thrown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and becomes unfruitful. So when we saw that word maremna, casting all your maremnas in 1 Peter 5, 7, after you humble yourself and or you cast your cares to humble yourself there in 1 Peter, that word is marimna. Well, guess what? That was the same word that we saw over there just a minute ago in Luke 21, 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts get overcharged with surfeiting drunkenness and the cares. That's the Greek word marimna. So just think, worry is trying to weigh you down like alcohol, like stress, like it's just trying to defeat you. Get your brain cells not working right. So you're not thinking correctly. Remember, we even saw on Sunday morning that, that we act the fool because we just allow the wrong feelings to stay. So, so he says here, he uses the same word, marimna, in verse 19. He says, the cares of this world, that's marimna, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires of other things, enter in and do what? Choke the word. Choke the word. The very thing that is your foundation of life and health and wholeness, and peace, and joy, the Word of God, the living Word. Jesus is your peace. Jesus is the Word, so the Word is your peace. And here, the very thing that you need is choked out. And he mentions three things. We're not going to take time to talk about the deceitfulness of riches or the lust of other things, but, but the one thing it says here, right here, he says, the cares of this world will choke the Word, and the Word will become unfruitful. Unfruitful. Fruit. Oh, joy. Oh, that's a fruit. Oh, yeah. Fruitful. Peace. Oh, yeah. Peace. That's, that's, yeah. Self-control. Peace. Oh, yeah. All those are fruit. But you're unfruitful. So that means you're unpeaceable, unlovable, unjoyous, un, 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 un. Till of the hun. I mean, un, un, whatever. Anyway. So notice here, again, this marimna. And, and remember, if you went back to the, the uh, wayside ground and, and the stony ground, it's Satan doing these things in these three grounds until you get to the good ground, right? And then you produce 30, 60, 100 fold. But right here, he's trying to stop you from producing peace and joy and, and walking in the blessings of heaven. And so he says, uh, he's letting us know that these thorns, one of those thorns is the cares of this world. Cares of this world. Well, we already found the world has stress and depression and worry and fears and panic attacks and all those things come against you, right? They already come against you. But be bold and courageous. Why? I've deprived it of power to harm you and conquered it for you. I took your place on the cross and already did it so you don't have to do it. That's the good thing. That's why it's called the good fight of faith. A good fight is when you get to rest. (laughs) That's a good fight when you, when you sit back and say, oh, my partner took care of it all. Yes. Yeah, my daddy, oh, you should have seen that knockout punch. Rose Jesus from the dead, and you and I were raised with him, and now we're seated in heavenly places right next to Jesus. All right, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. I wanted you to see the same marimna, the same cares that you're supposed to be casting, now we see that the deceptiveness of it, the danger of allowing them to stay, and how Satan is trying to use it to stop the word from working. If the word's not working, peace is not flowing. Joy's not flowing. Love's not flowing. Amen. Amen. And so he says, listen, humble yourselves, verse 6, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. By the way, that Greek word for exalt means to elevate uh, up above or to lift up out of. Hmm. Elevate or to lift up. Well, what, are you, what do we need elevated up out of or, or pulled up out of? The mully grubs, <laughs> the, the dumps being down where you're so far down, you're like the drunk man and, and you're not up at the level where the Holy Ghost is talking. So you need to be exalted. That doesn't mean praised Like we use the word exalt, the Greek word means to be lifted up or elevated up out of. So you're being pulled up out of the muck and mire of life. 
and your your feet are being set on solid ground, the Word. And now you're in a position where all of a sudden, hey, I'm starting to hear from God again. Or maybe I'm starting to hear from God the first time, but it's because you're no longer worried about something. No longer stress. I've had numerous people through these number of years that God had me teach on this where they had been to, uh, they, they were sick, they were diseased, they had physical pain in their bodies, and they'd been to numerous meetings with well-known preachers, had hands laid on them by the most famous preachers, and never got healed. And they came and sat in a meeting, and I never prayed for them. I just taught them how to walk in peace, live in peace and joy. And they started walking and living in peace and joy, and all the symptoms left their body. Well, that's no kudos on me, man. That's kudos on the Word. Before, I guess they were trying to get a quick fix, but just lay hands on me, see if you can do it. But then they came to the point where they realized, I have to make a choice. And I choose peace. I choose the way of peace. Remember yesterday we saw the way of peace. We can walk in that way all the time. It's one of the ways God's made made for us so that we can live in peace. And he goes on. Now, this is something I never did, but the Lord showed me this. Again, I never was taught it. I just was, the Lord showed me. I never put verse 7 with verse 8 because I never heard a preacher do it. Verse 8 was always taught, you know, you know, pay attention, be on your guard. Your adversary is the devil. He's trying to devour you. But I never realized how he was trying to devour me. It just got done telling me by me getting into pride, not casting my care. That's the very thing that he's trying to do to choke the word so he can devour me and keep me down in the dumps. Amen. That's right. Amen. Yes. So he says, be sober after he tells you to cast your care because God cares for you. Then pay attention, be on your guard because you have an adversary roaring like a lion. Doesn't say he is a lion, says he's... Well, it doesn't say, but we know he's a pussycat with no teeth. So what's he going to try and do, gum you to death? But he's going to roar. Yeah, he's going to roar real loud. And he'll roar, stress, depression. Oh, look what he did. Look what she did. Look what they did. Look how they left you out. Hurt feelings. And he's going to roar real loud. Trying to do what? Seeking whom he may what? The context is God resists the proud. You're not having grace flow. So grace isn't flowing. If grace isn't flowing, uh, you're going to be devoured. You realize because all the junk the world's going to throw at you, you're going to be devoured if you do it in your own strength. No man's able to stand on his own. You're not sufficient as of to think anything of yourself, 2 Corinthians 3, 5. So pay attention. Be on your guard. You have an adversary. Uh, He's roaring real loud like a lion, trying to find somebody he can devour. I like the fact that it says, seeking whom he may devour. Since it says he's seeking, that means he can't devour everybody. When he comes to you and you submit to the word and you resist him, he has to flee and go try and find somebody else. And he comes to uh, Pastor Pam and tries to devour her, and she says, it is written, and he has to flee. And then he comes to Pastor Mark, and he says, it is written, he has to flee. And then he comes to Jerry Furchner and, and, and says this, and, and Jerry says, no, it is written, and he has to flee. As long as he keeps coming across you and me that are doing the word, acting like the word is true, he's going to have to keep seeking. And the only ones he can devour, we already saw, are the ones that get the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, the ones that won't humble themselves and cast the care and enter into pride. Those are the ones he can devour, but he can't unless we let him. Why? He's powerless. Amen. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to get raptured when, I, when I'm preaching this stuff because it, it just sounds so fun. A fun way to live, a a happy way to live, a a joyous way to live that I I can choose this way every day of my life. (sighs) Pinch, pinch. Are you are you really alive? (laughs) Yeah, I'm alive in Christ, living the life that He lives. 1 John 2, 6 says we're to walk even as he walked. And we're able to do that because 1 John 2, 27, you have the same anointing in you that Jesus had in him. 
Man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, well, I've gone about 45 minutes now. Do you guys want me to go just a t- tad longer? Yeah. This is our last meeting. Yeah. So you want a couple more scriptures real quick? Yeah. All right, let me show you a couple more scriptures. Go to, um, go to Psalm 119, verse 165. Psalm 119, verse 165. And I encourage you to go back because, you know, right where we were just reading, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, uh, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The very next verse that we didn't read in verse 9 of 1 Peter 5 says, whom, talking about the devil, resist steadfast with your faith. Resist him. So in other words, that's how, that's part of the humility. You're resisting the devil. And what, what does the devil have to do when you submit to God and resist him? James 4, 7 says he has to flee, right? All right. So look at Psalm 119, verse 165. It says, great peace. Everybody shout great peace. Great peace. So how many of you like that word great peace? Isn't, doesn't that even sound really big? I mean, great peace. I don't just have little peace. I have great peace. All right, so it says, great peace of they which love the word. Now, it says the law, and it's referring under the old covenant about the law of Moses. We're not under the law, although we are under the law of the life, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and we are under the law of love, and we are under the perfect law of liberty, which is God's word. So you could actually, uh, what I call New Testamize this verse. Okay. Somebody said New Testamize. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> I just made it up. So I New Testamize this and read it this way. Read it this way. Great peace of they which love the word and nothing shall offend them. Amen. Great peace of they which love the word and nothing shall offend them. Nada. Zilcho. Zero. You're dead <laughs> So you're not going to get offended. You're not going to get your feelings hurt. You're not going to get mad and uptight. Why? Because you love the word. I actually use this, and I've done this so many times, I, I couldn't count them all. There's been so many times when I have feelings, just, I have feelings just like everybody else, where a negative emotion will come, where somebody does something and you feel like knocking their head off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> car cuts you off and you feel like giving them a finger. Yeah. <laughs> See, y'all thought I was, t- y'all, y'all, y'all minds went to the gutter. I was talking about a Donald Trump finger. (laughs) Great peace. Listen, great peace of they which love the word. And what shall offend them? Nothing shall get them uptight. Nothing shall cause them to panic. Nothing shall get them depressed. Nothing shall get them flying off the handle. Nothing shall get them full of guilt. Nothing if you love the word. And specifically, the words we're talking about is... Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, that Jesus bore your grief and sorrow and depression and stress and worry and then faced every reason or cause and defeated it for you. And in the world, you're going to face all those things, but they're powerless, so be bold and courageous because he's already overcome them for you. That's specifically the word that you're going to believe, and then nothing shall hurt your feelings. Nada. Nada. Nothing. All right, let's go to Isaiah 26, 3. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, and then we're going to close with the next verse after this. And we'll look at this one, and then we'll close over in uh, Jeremiah. So Isaiah chapter 26 and verse number 3. This is one that I used to teach to Rachel, Rachel when she was in middle school, and then on up into early part of high school. I would, when I'd drive her to school, I would ask her, Rachel, what does Isaiah 26, 3 say? And I would have her quote it. Now, King James says, thou, and of course, we don't talk that way, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So I had her get rid of the thee and the thous, you know, and just make it plain. And I said, so Rachel, tell me what Isaiah 26, 3 says. And of course, I would quote it to her until she learned it over and over and over and over until she learned it. And then I would have her say, God, you will keep me in perfect peace when I think about you all day long because I trust in you. God, God says right here, he, thou, you, God, will keep him, that's you or me, in perfect peace 
whose mind, so there's the you and me that really qualify, the ones that our minds are stayed on him. God will keep us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed on him. Listen, let me tell you something about perfect peace. Perfect peace is even better than great peace. <laughs> great peace is great, but perfect doesn't get any better. And you know the cool thing about this is, is uh, I remember reading this one time, and this was after my experience where the Lord had taught me all this stuff, and I was already living in peace and joy and just refusing to ever have another blue Monday the rest of my life and, uh, or terrible Tuesday or wicked Wednesday or, you know, any of those days. I just said, no, I'm never having any of those days again ever. Um, and then I was reading this verse, God, you'll keep me in perfect peace, and all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute, the word peace is perfect. Because if you've studied out this word peace, it's the word shalom. And you can't get any more perfect than shalom. Because right. shalom means completeness and soundness and wholeness and, and health and, and the miraculous. I mean, this, this word shalom is amazing. In fact, you may have heard somebody give this def definition, nothing missing, nothing broken. Well, that's accurate. It's not what the Hebrew says, but it's accurate because it, the Hebrew says wholeness and completeness and soundness. So that means nothing missing, nothing broken. I, I add this to that. Nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing malfunctioning. Amen. Yes, amen. I'm not going to have any part of my body malfunctioning. Yeah, yeah. When I'm 120, if Jesus tarries and 130 and 140, man, I'm still young. <laughs> wow. I just realized I'll be, tomorrow's my birthday, I'll be 70 tomorrow, and I'm not even halfway. That's pretty cool. I'm not even halfway, because I'm living way past 120. 120 is minimum. I'm not letting Moses outdo me. Uh-uh. If he could do it without the greater one on the inside of him. Besides, you know what the Lord told me years ago? He says, who's your example? Is it Moses? Is it David? Or is it Abraham? Amen. Ding! The father of us all. The father of our faith. He lived till 175. <laughs> okay. You just do what you want. I think I'll do what I want. <laughs> God said you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Now, girls, behave yourself. God will keep us in perfect peace when our minds are stayed on him, girls. Our minds <laughs> stayed on him. And why, why are our minds stayed on him? Because we trust in him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Listen, there is no other way to be happy. Not in Jesus. You have to trust and obey if you want to be happy in Jesus got to trust and obey. And here, this says right here that think about this, your father, the one that's on the inside of you that put his peace and joy on the inside of you. He said he would keep you in this shalom. And then if you look up the word perfect, which I didn't tell you what that Greek word or Hebrew word is, that Hebrew word for perfect is shalom. God actually gives you a double dose. <laughs> said, I'm going to give you shalom, shalom. Shalom's perfect, but I'm going to give you double perfection. <laughs> He's always the God who is more than enough, right? Perfection is enough, but he said, no, I'm just going to give you more. You're just going to get overloaded. You're going to have so much flowing out of you, the rivers of living water, people will be drinking it. And then you'll be letting your light so shine before men, and they'll be seeing your good works, and they'll want to glorify your Father in heaven. That's what life's about. All right, let's close tonight over in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. There's so much more here. By the way, I was just thinking this when I was praying for you guys today and asking the Lord, okay, what do you want me to share tonight and all that? I was in my hotel room and, and Liz had gone out and so I was by myself and, and, uh, and I was thinking about this. I thought, you know, uh, I just finished uh, 50 programs on my television series on this subject, 50. Now my television programs are 30 minute long, so 50 30 minute programs on this subject. <laughs> and you, you, you didn't even get one week's worth <laughs> for, the, for these three services. So I'm not saying that as a downer because God's given you what you need to, to live this way. 
But what I'm saying is for those of you that are real serious about this and you just really want to delve into this and you don't want to stop, you just want to keep growing and feeding, go to, go to my Facebook page, my personal Larry Hutton Facebook page personal, or you can go to our Larry Hutton Ministries YouTube page or Larry Hutton Ministries Facebook page. But uh, the YouTube page, I do, I put them both. I put that 50 TV programs on Facebook, and I put it on our Larry Hutt Ministries YouTube. So anytime you want to, you can just go there, and it's free. So you can watch the TV program free on YouTube, Larry Hutt Ministry YouTube channel, or my personal Facebook page, Larry Hutton. You can watch all 50 programs there, one a day, one a week, whatever you want to do. You can watch 10 a week and get drunk on the Word if you want. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So I just wanted you to know, because there is a lot more that we could teach, but obviously we were limited with these three services, so go ahead and just feed on the Word of God. All right, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7, and verse number 8. What's the first word of verse 7? Blessed. blessed. You know that word blessed in the Hebrew also means happy? Happy. You can be happy all the time. So blessed or happy is the man that trusts in the Lord. And whose hope the Lord is. In other words, you're putting your hope in him. Verse 8. For he, he is the person that he just got done spoken of. The one that's trusting God and keeping your hope in him. That person shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spread out her roots by the river. So when a tree is planted by waters, we have some trees. We have the house my dad built in Florida. When my dad passed away a few years ago, my mom passed away. My brother and I kept the house because my dad built it. It was paid for, so it doesn't cost us anything. And so we decided, let's keep the house. Uh, in fact, Pastor Mark and Pastor Pam have been down to that house and vacationed in it. And um, so we kept it. But there's, I'm thinking of there's this one huge cypress tree down by the lake that spread out her roots by the water. And it's always vibrant because there's always water to the roots, right? That's what it's saying here. You're going to be full of life, full of vibrancy when you're planted by the waters. Of course, Jesus is the waters, right? He's the, the living water, right? So we'll be like a tree planted by the living water, spread out of roots by the river. That's the river of life and shall not see when heat comes. Hmm. Whether it's natural heat or whether it's heat from somebody or someone or something or some situation or some cause, the fire's been turned up, the, the uh, furnace has been heated seven times hotter than normal, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whatever. It doesn't matter when the heat comes because you're, you're planted by the waters. You're trusting in the Lord and your hope is in the Lord, Amen. right? And it goes on, her leaf shall be green. So that means you're still prospering. Everything is not your source. God's your source. Amen. Right? Amen. So even if it looked like the 401k or the IRA or this, that, and the other is all gone down to tubes. No, it doesn't matter. God's my source. I'll always have more than enough. If you believe that and say that, that means you're trusting in the Lord and your hope is in Him, Amen. not in you. Yeah. Right? So your leaf, doesn't, uh, your leaf stays green. And watch this. You will not be careful. In the year of drought. Yes. What do you mean not be careful? You'll be carefree. Amen. Careful is when you're full of care. Stress full. Depression full. Discouragement full. But you don't have to be. Because why? Because you're trusting in the Lord. Your hope is in Jesus. You are in him. In him. Acts 17, 28. In him you live. In him you move. And in him you have your being. Is that right? So the year of drought, you don't get careful. Now watch the last statement of the verse, verse 9, or verse 8. Neither shall cease from yielding what? Fruit. Neither shall cease from yielding peace. Yes, right. Neither shall cease from yielding joy. Yes, right. Neither shall cease from yielding self-control. Yes. Kindness, gentleness. Neither shall cease from yielding faith. You won't cease when you're continually trusting in the Lord and you're keeping your hope in Him. Amen. But the moment we allow the moment of stress, depression, remember it all starts with a thought and it has no power over you. It has to get you to try and think on it enough so you start thinking that the situation, 
the way somebody treated you, what's going on, what hasn't happened, what should have happened but didn't happen, all the different things. He's going to try and get you to dwell on those things so that 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 powerless depression or that powerless stress or that powerless panic is going to overwhelm you because it's usurping your authority. And then you took the moment and you build that monument. I'm telling you what, though, the power of peace is so powerful, even if you built a monument, you can break it in a moment. You just stop and you repent. That means you turn the other direction and you say, "Uh oh, wait, stop. Jesus already bore this for me. I'm not having this in my life. I submit to the word of God. I have the peace of God that passes understanding. I have the joy unspeakable that's full of the glory of God. I will not let myself be discouraged and neither will I allow myself to be afraid. The peace of God is a big grapefruit. (laughs) Huge on the inside of me. I refuse to worry. And think about that. Man, living this way. You're looking at one happy camper. (laughs) I don't care what anybody does, what anybody says. I'm going to live in peace and joy because of the one who's in me and what he's done for me. I refuse to belittle the blood. I'm not going to enter into pride by carrying cares and worry and stressing about things, getting uptight about situations. I refuse. I am not going to. You can't make me. Make me. (laughs) Go ahead. Make me. Make my day. (laughs) Because it's a day the Lord already made. And I'm going to rejoice and be glad no matter what. Amen. Was this all right? Wow. I'm, I'm expecting now, that when I, whether I see you guys a few months from now or a year from now, next time I see you, I expect every one of you to be walking up to me and say, Brother Larry, the last day I had, uh, the last down day I had was the, your, your birthday last year. <laughs> or the day before your birthday last year, if you started tonight. Or maybe some of you started yesterday. <laughs> if you started, yeah, well, the last down day I had was Sunday, uh, July 28th. <laughs> Why? Because I'm looking at a bunch of doers. Amen. Right? Not hearers. Hearers and doers. But the only way you do it, in fact, when you, if you're one of our partners, you're going to be getting my partner letter that I just wrote. When you get this month's partner letter, just know this. I wrote it while I was in California. <laughs> I finished it today. So my office will be mailing it out here in the next few days, and then you'll get it the next week. So when you get the partner letter, it's extra special because it's a California partner letter. (laughs) But I even wrote in that just about how, well, what we're talking about here, how to be happy and and how to, to continue in the word is the key to being a doer. Continue therein. Remember in James chapter 1? You're not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work because he is a continual hearer. So you continue to look and you continue to meditate. You continue to hear with your ears. So do like I said. You go on Facebook or YouTube and listen to the series or, or you get uh, my book, The Internal Affairs, and you read it several times, not just one time. You get a hold of uh, the peace scriptures. You know, we have. I brought that up so I would remember to say tonight. You get a hold of the peace scriptures. Uh, that's a CD, or if you, if you purchase the download MP3. Uh, it's just an hour. I don't preach or teach at all. All I do is quote peace scriptures, shalom scriptures. So when, you get, when you're full of shalom, you're thinking complete soundness and wholeness. And then when the temptation comes to get down or depressed, you don't allow it, right? right. So you, you get a hold of that. You keep, you continue in the Word of God. Liz's, one of Liz's favorite is my Power Up recording. Huh, honey? I got in her car not long ago, and I started up. I was driving it somewhere, and p- Power Up came on. <laughs> and what it is, it's just an hour of victorious living scriptures. Well, it gives you boldness and confidence and assurance that you can trust God when you're thinking, I'm an overcomer, I'm more than a conqueror, this is the victory that overcomes the world, my faith. When you're listening to all those kind of scriptures, it gives you boldness and confidence. And God says, be bold and courageous, I've overcome the world. So get a hold of the power up, and that's back there as well. And then um, I I just wanted to 
uh, ask you guys to pray for us and, and believe with us for more partners. We want to reach more people around the world, and it takes partners to do that. I know several of you in here are partners. The church is a monthly partner. Um, but if you're not a partner, there are partner cards back on the product table. You can pick one up, fill it out, or you can go on our website and fill out a partner card. And so uh, if you would consider that, if, if you feel like this message has helped you and you'd like to help our ministry become a partner, um, just wanted to make that available to you. No pressure, not twisting any arm or anything. We, we obviously want you to partner with whoever you feel in your heart you're supposed to, but if you uh, have any inclination to help us, then there are partner cards on the product table back there. Praise God. Let me pray for you, all right? Hallelujah. Father, right now I pray for all of my brothers, all of my sisters. Father, there's such a, such a, wow, a fullness, a, a, a um, wow, what's the word, Lord, that I'm looking for? I can say it in tongues. <laughs> Lord, is such a... a enlargement of, of truth here that we've seen and heard that, that is just, uh, it's captivating to our souls, but yet it's liberating. And so thank you that, that we are taken captive by your truth. We're taken captive by your words and we're liberated from all the works of darkness. And so thank you, Father, for doing that for all of my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Father God, as each one of them act on your word and start speaking your word boldly out of their mouths, that all grace is going to abound to them. That grace that you talked about in 1 Peter, they're going to humble themselves. They're going to cast a they're going to cast stress. They're going to cast panic attack. They're going to cast anything that they've been told that, that bipolar. They're going to cast bipolar. They're going to cast, they're going to cast every single one of those cares because humility will cause grace to come. And grace is an empowerment that overcomes any natural situation. No matter how powerful it may seem in the natural realm, we don't care. It's not bigger than the name of Jesus. And so I thank you, Father, for each and every one. I pray your strength over them, your goodness over them. I pray, Lord God, your comfort over them. I pray that you'd open the eyes of their understanding, fill them with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, Lord God. And I thank you, Father God, your goodness, oh, a glimpse of your goodness, how good you are. Just show them how good you are. Your goodness is what caused men to turn around and go the right direction, Father. Thank you for your goodness. And so I thank you for that, Father. And now, Lord, because everyone is anyone that was down in the, in the rut, down in the, the alcohol of stress, worry, depression, now, now that they've come up out, because even while we're talking tonight, they have come up out of that. You've exalted them up out of that because they've been casting their cares. Lord, I thank you, Father God. Now they'll start hearing your voice. I thank you. Things are going to become clear, clear. I hear the Spirit of God saying clear and clarity. Things that you've needed to understand, things that you've needed to know, things that you've been crying out for will begin to flow and you will hear clearly so you can make the right decision. Haha. <laughs> Correct Holy Ghost led decisions. Even from this night and forward, saith the Lord. Because you're on my wavelength now. You're on my wavelength of grace, my grace wave. <laughs> yeah, now you're, now you're hearing things that are only available because of what I've done, having nothing to do with your performance, but all to do with what I've done for you, saith the Lord. So now you're in a position of rest. Stay there. Stay resting in me. Stay there, says the Lord. Because it didn't matter what's happened. It didn't matter what they did or they didn't do. What matters is what I did and what I did do for you. And I've done it all. When I said the three famous words, it is finished, I meant what I said. I said what I meant. So rest in me. Rest in me. Like I said, I will keep you in shalom, shalom when you keep thinking about me all the day long and you keep your mind fixed on me, says the Lord, because you trust me, because your faith is in me and in me alone. 
I am your all in all. I am your creator. I am the one that formed you in the womb and called you from your mother's womb, which is why you're alive today. I have purpose for you, saith the Lord. So know, know, know that you are a very vital and important part. I don't care if you think you're the little toenail on the little toe of the right foot. I don't care the left foot. It doesn't matter. You're an important part of my body, saith the Lord. And you are needed by all the other parts of the body so that the body will be whole. That's how important you are. That's how much I love you, saith the Lord. So don't you worry. No more. Your down days are over. Your worry-filled days are over. Your stress-filled days are over, saith the Lord. No more. Make a choice. Make a once and for all choice. And then when the things come, keep making the choice over and over and over that you choose peace. You choose the way of peace. You choose me, saith the Lord. Every single time. When the moment comes... You're not building a monument. When the moment comes, your eyes, your focus, and your attention are on me, saith the Lord. That's where you stay. You stay right there, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of everything about faith that you could know. I started your faith. I gave you my faith. And I'll keep my faith working through you when you keep your eyes on me. And I'll bring it to completion, saith the Lord. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. When you think you've gone through where you've reached the end of your rope and you don't feel like you can go any further, think of me. Consider me. <laughs> And what I endured on the cross, consider me. What I endured, not just everything that you're going through, but everything you're going through to the nth degree of the complete entire human race. Consider me. And then you'll realize, ha, 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 ha. Oh, this little thing I'm going through is a molehill. Nothing I have to worry about, Jesus. I just keep my care on you. I keep all of my trust all of my faith, all of my confidence, all of my hope in you. That's what I'm telling you to do right now, says the Lord. And those simple acts of faith will be huge releases of my grace. Wow. Thank you for that, Lord. I received that for myself, and we're all receiving that word from the Lord right now. Thank you, Lord. 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 Now, I have an unction by the Holy Ghost. I think I know why the Lord just told me to do this, and that's this. Everybody look up here at me. You know when... You guys are like this. You know when somebody loves you, right? You know when you have a hookup with somebody, right? And I have that. Liz and I have that when we come here with you guys. So it's like I just feel like I'm with family. I have a hookup, man. If we pray together, then bless God, we can pray heaven down, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? We can, we can just like you guys do together. So I just, I just heard the Lord. And he, and he told me this before, and I've been praying this myself, and there's been other prophets and men and women of God praying things. But I just saw something in the Spirit, and I heard the Lord say this, that there's uh, going to be an attempted attack of terrorist activity in this nation before the election to try and stop the election. And you and I are going to bind it right now. I'm going to pray, and where two or three agree, it shall be done. Because we are not happy. We know a lot of terrorists, if, unless, you've, unless you've had your head in the stand, sand. If you haven't, you know there's a lot of terrorists that have come across our borders. And they have evil planned for our nation. They want this nation to be a communist nation. They want to overthrow this nation. But that's not going to happen. Because God's not through with us yet. This is a child of God nation established by the children of God. It's going to keep on going. No devil of hell is going to stop it. 
So we're going to pray right now. I know this is going to take just a minute longer than we were planning, but we're flowing with the Holy Ghost, all right? So I'm going to pray, and I want you guys to agree with me. And we're going to bind, because God said, whatever you, as my children, bind on earth, it will be backed up by heaven, right? But we are the ones that have to do the binding and the loosing. So, so we're going to do that. Is that okay? And if you're a visitor or somebody and you don't understand all this, then just listen to the rest of us because all we're doing is what Scripture says to do. We're not making this stuff up. We're not weird. We're just doing what Jesus did. And we're obeying what Jesus told us to do. All right, so bow your head. Just focus on Jesus. And then I'm going to pray and you just believe with me and agree with me and set your heart in agreement. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we come against any spirits demonic forces of darkness, wickedness, spiritual wickedness in high places. We come against all demonic moves that would work through terrorists, that would work through a man or a woman to to try and bring harm to this nation, to try and stop Christianity from having a move in this nation. We bind that spirit right now. We bind every demon. We bind every devil in the name of Jesus. You will not cause problem. You will not cause terrorist activity. You will not cause a bunch of people to die. You will not in Jesus' name. We bind you. We speak the blood of Jesus over you. We loose ministering spirits of heaven, the host, the ones with flaming swords and chariots, the angels of heaven. Go forth over this nation. Blanket this nation. Protect the United States of America because we've got to get the gospel out to the rest of the world. So save this nation by your spirit, by your power, by your anointing. We speak it forth. We believe it, Lord God. It shall be even as we're speaking it. And everybody said that agreed said, so be it. Say, it shall be. We believe and we speak and therefore we have it. Glory. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's amazing, the Spirit of God, what he just said to me. He said, you can accomplish mountains of stuff in moments of time. We just accomplished a lot in a very short time right there. And we know we're not the only ones. God's calling other children of God, men and women of God. We're probably just coming in agreement with them without even knowing it. But God is not done with this nation. We're going to see a move of God like we've never seen before. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, God. Thank you, Father. 